Neil, who is uh, there uh, with the shirt on, is a man who has got a really lovely eclectic taste in cars and quite rightly pointed out that he's a car addict, not a collector, which is exactly what I am. And I wrote a column about that once. I um, and I, yeah. and, I, and I, I, I totally agree with that phrase as well. But if we'd done collect, if we'd done addicted to cars.com or something, then it wouldn't have worked. Collecting addicts. So collecting addicts. <laughs> Hello and welcome to an unnamed Collecting Cars product that will probably generate a name during the next hour. It's either a sofa chat or it's a podcast or it's a collection of voices that I think have an awful lot to say that is very entertaining and I want to share about the subject of motor cars and the automotive industry. That goes as far as motorsport to the 1952 375cc 2CV. I don't know. It's a broad spectrum. Our church is broad. Um, and we want to share this with you. It might be a regular feature. It might not. We'll see how it goes. Um, my guests, um, as you know, my regular features are Neil Clifford, Chris Cooper, Manish Pandey and Edward Lovett. I'll tell you what, I'm not going to say what they do. You can probably guess what they do or Google them. But right now, all you need to know is they are eclectic, knowledgeable voices on the subject of the cars. By all means, go and Google them. I'm not going to tell you what they do, although the poster behind Manish's head rather gives his game away. Um, so we're going to start with, um, I think, what will be one of the great subjects of 2023, and that is Fernando Alonso's move to Aston Martin, because I think this is like lobbing a Bengal tiger into a pen full of ducks. Over to you, first of all, Manish, whose world is F1. What are you going to say about this? Um, I don't think you could have put it any better. I think you've got probably one of the toughest characters who has ever been in Formula One, but at the same time, he is unspeakably sensitive. And um, I mean, in some ways, Fernando is a walking grenade with a pin missing, isn't he? <laughs> I can just see, I can just see it. Hey, it could go completely right. Maybe last year, you know, the, they'll have learned so much about the car. Um, Vettel will have done just so much homework on it. And uh, it'll just come out so sorted and so ready for Fernando to grab and drive. Or more likely, they're going to be reaching for the stars with a milk stool. And he's going to spot that at some point in the season. <laughs> and um, there's going to be a lot of spilt milk. <laughs> Mr. Cooper, what do you reckon? So, so uh, are you a Fernando um, fan or not? Um, that's a really good question. I probably am because he just can't help himself. I mean, I think these two, it's really interesting. I think L Stroll and Fernando are two of, for completely different reasons, are two of the most polarizing characters on the grid. And uh, it's really, really hard to call how it's going to go. Um, you could say, I mean, Sebastian with him was with Stroll. It was Sebastian Mark II. He was, he completely chilled. He completely calmed down. But if you look at how Fernando ended up in that team and that extraordinary period in August last year mm. when, you know, poor old Otmar was saying, yeah, yeah, no, we're fine, we're fine. And, you know, I think he's on holiday somewhere else. And then Fernando that day made sure oh. he was on social media eating an ice cream in a street in Spain somewhere, which was that to uh, Otmar. He just, he just doesn't know. You're right. He's a, he's a hand grenade with... With the Please, pin missing. But to interrupt there quickly, so there's three of you, well, actually all four of you, apart from me, run businesses. If you had a senior employee, basically a number two or a number three to you, that did that to you without really any word it was going to happen, you'd go absolutely nuts, wouldn't you? I mean, you is you there anything more disrespectful? Neil, what I'm, do you reckon? If someone did that to you, you'd, you'd, you'd end up finding out where they live, wouldn't you? You would. <laughs> you would. Yeah, you would. And, and I'm assuming that Mr. Stroll Sr. thought, I just need a world champion. I can't, I've got so little going for me. I need a world champion. Um, who's left? Who will come here? And clearly, Fernando, I mean, he's extraordinary. I mean, how was he now, 41? I think it's a brilliant signing for them. But yeah, I, so do I. The only issue is it's going to totally embarrass his son. <laughs> I mean, it's going, to be, it's going to be a shocker, isn't it? I mean... You think I, think, that? I think it's a brilliant signing if you're if you're Aston Martin, the so-called Aston Martin, the F1 brand. 
Well, I think not, I, not I, I'm not sure. I, mean, I, 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 I suspect Chris was going to say I'm not sure Stroll will be, Lance Stroll will be embarrassed. I mean, he at times he surprises us with his pace, but let's forget it wasn't last year, it was the year before when they had the when they basically had the clone of the Mercedes. That was a much better car, and Lance did clearly get his head around it. But the Vettel we had last year, although he became this, he emerged as this father figure of F1, this character we all love. It was a brilliant, it was a brilliant way to end yeah. his career. But I don't think for a minute he was driving on the same level that Alonso was. I think Alonso, no, no. I, the, I mean, the amazing he, thing about Alonso is he's, I think if you put him in a front running car now, he could win a championship. He's still yeah, that good. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I have this conversation with my, my two sons. Um, I've got twin boys who are in their early 20s. And at a character level, personality level, we all love Fernando just because he can't help us. I'm like Nigel didn't know how to help himself. When the stats were entering last year, so Fernando outqualified Esteban 11-10, which is closer than you might think. Um, Sebastian and Lance was 13-7. So I think it's going to be, I asked mm. the boys, what do you think it's going to be next year? It's going to be 43-0. Yeah. Fernando. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens, so what happens when it doesn't go Fernando's way? And there's a couple of races where there's, there's a few technical failures and manager's going to grin now. We know this is what's going to happen. A couple of failures, or he and then he suddenly thinks a bit like Hungary 2007. He suddenly thinks oh. that someone, someone's getting better kit than him, and it and it's just happens that, that, that his the other bloke's daddy owns the team. I can just see, I mean, c- can you imagine? Okay, I'll fast forward to the point. He tried to blackmail Ron. How does he try and blackmail Lance? What does that how does that work? I mean, where do, where would he start? I mean, there so, <laughs> must be so much. Ammunition. I mean, this, I this, just... is, this is another event for us talking about Aston Martin generally, but there must be so much ammunition. And you just but... know it's going to happen. He just doesn't care. He really clearly doesn't care. Well, I, I, think, I, think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a fantastic thing to experience. Sorry, Manish, carry on. No, I was going to say that um, <clears throat> Ron Dennis isn't, you know, he, he's no pussycat. And I think what was so strange about the whole aftermath of Spygate Sorry, of Crashgate was um, mm. no of Spygate of Spygate. Spygate. The whole, the, it's all episode eight to me now. Um, <laughs> the whole aftermath of Spygate was Ron having a begrudging admiration for what Fernando did because what he really said in the end was, "The thing I love most about this guy is he will do anything to win," and that's the kind of person we employ. I suspect a tiny bit of Mister Stroll Senior. Is going to be exactly like that. The more ruthless Fernando is, the absolutely more kind of you know grabbing that team, that car, whatever it, he needs to do by the neck. I think he's going to admire him for it. I yeah, really I think do. I think you're right though. Actually, I mean, I, I was I was I, I went to a few races last year with my son, who's now a mega addict of the whole thing, and we were in the crowd at Austin. And the funny thing about that was. Every American in the whole grandstand took the piss out of Stroll every single time he went round every single lap because oh, of you know the Canadian thing, the fact that you know he's daddy's boy, the fact unfireable. that unfireable, yeah, unfireable. It was just like hysterics every single lap. Now, how many American Grand Prix are there this year? There's two or three or whatever. So it's going to be. It's going to be huge, huge pressure on him in a way. Maybe he doesn't care. Maybe his dad doesn't care. Is he unfireable? Uh, I think will do great. I, I think, think he might be unfireable. But also, the thing that has to be added is, of course, he, he created the shunt of the year, didn't he, at that yeah. race at Austin with yeah. his teammate for the following year. I mean, yeah. how, I mean how much of Fernando's extremely un- uncharacteristically calm reaction was created by the fact that he realised that he might be creating a diplomatic situation before he's even landed in the team? And just kept going, that, just like... His eyes. It was just a great line. He goes, well, you know, total racing accident. <laughs> <laughs> right, I think, um, I think we'll move on from Formula One. I want, to, um, I want to, to, to open this wide now. It's a totally different subject. Uh, I think mm-hmm. we all know the car market's going to be um, tumultuous in 2023. But whenever something goes into a state of flux, great things emerge. There are bargains to be had when prices come down. And, then, and I think we know they are going to change a bit. Let's go around, just gradually have a conversation around what we think is, is a car to buy. Something that's great value, that is undervalued, underloved, underappreciated. 
if I was to give you, and it's, it doesn't matter, it could be at a very top end. I hope some of us might come out with some, some vehicles that aren't £7 million, because that wouldn't make us look very, very every man or every woman. Oh, so let's 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 start with come on, Edward, you go first. What would you what would you what would you say is looking hot to trot for this year? I, I, I as you know, I'd I like to shy away from investment chatter. As I'm not very good at it. I'm a, I'm the worst car dealer in the world. And, and and if I'm totally honest, I see very little value in general out there, especially if you're buying somewhat speculatively. So you've got to just buy with your heart. And by the end of the year, you shouldn't care less what it's worth. And hopefully you'll be all right. Um, Now, Neil (laughs) bought himself something rather beautiful recently. So I I find it hard not to look at what other people have bought and feel deadly jealous I don't have one of those. So Before Neil answers, can I just say, but that is the most unhelpful answer you could possibly have given. We've looked to you you as our leader. You've just given me a load of bollocks. Well, I know that. But it's going to come back. It's going to come back to an answer, and and, and actually, I think a beautiful E-type is something um, mm. I, I would be happy to put my money in today. Mm. Come on, Neil, let's hear about it. Well, look, I've, I've as 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 you guys know, I'm quite an addict. I'm buying any old shit basically that's got four <laughs> wheels. But the 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 two things I've recently bought that I'm super excited about, Chris, one will be particularly for you is a Subaru Litchfield T25. Oh, nice. $40,000 from new. Nice. One owner. I'm going to write that down. Bought it directly from Litchfield. Stupidly, I don't know why, Litchfield won't bloody service it for me because they're all more interested in people wanting to spend 10 grand on a 911T or something. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll go around there with a spanner and have a word with him. Maybe yeah. you, didn't, you didn't speak to him in Cheltenham or Gloucester and you didn't understand. No, I, I rang them twice. Oh, no, we don't even have the equipment anymore. I'm sorry. But anyway, it's got the Porsche brake upgrade. It's got the wheel upgrade. It's got the adjustable suspension. It's not the bug eye. It's the other one. I never know what those bloody code words are for it. It's the 2005, obviously in blue. Fantastic four door 911 turbo s basically for 25 grand yeah i think that that is that's value that's value value. and you know you get your winter tires on it and off you go and you you know you think think you'd sort of stick blomfist or something is but do you find when you drive it that there that actually there is subliminally a button that you you press that just says twat (laughs) it's the water you one, you know, the, the, the water one that goes on the radiator or the gearbox or that little yeah. button under the steering wheel, which, frankly, I've no fucking idea what it does. <laughs> it's just magic, that button. Uh, and um, so I think that is, I think Subaru, I've never liked Mitsubishi Evo 6. You know, there's this yeah. big argument on whether it's the Tommy Mackinnon or whether it's the Subaru and I've never owned a Subaru. I've had two Evo 6, never liked them. I always feel like you're driving on ice. I'm not a good enough driver, frankly. It's a bit like that R34 thing. It never feels like I know what I'm doing. The Subaru's brilliant. You feel like you're the king of the road. And it's so fast. And the other the other thing I've so I'll, I'll, I'll to Subaru, and I suppose the other thing I've bought is, not from collecting cars, a 599. GTB. Ah. Yeah, why is it the blue potsy one? <clears throat> blue potsy, tan, no shields, fantastic spec, like a proper Instagram porno spec. <laughs> and you know what? When that car came out, we all thought it was massive. It was fat. I know you had one, Chris. I've watched the video like 10 million times. But now suddenly, compared to the and I adore the F12, frankly. I think it's probably the prettiest of all of them. But it feels small suddenly. Yes, Those buttresses, the front, that line that goes along the wings, which is wings basically 275. It is so pretty. And for 70 or 80 grand, it's a bargain. V12, Enzo engine, magic. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to apply a pin to the balloon here. And I'm far enough away from Neil that he can't punch me in the face. But he's much bigger than me. First of all, technically, it's wider than an F12. That was the big news about the F12 when it came out. They'd made a smaller yeah. car. Yeah. Than the, uh, and, and the other bit is, 
how do you live with that gearbox? Because yeah. that gearbox is utter shite. No, I, I love the rest I, of the car, but the gearbox. Yeah. I disagree in a way because, you know, I've, I have an F12, just to sound <laughs> like a flash gear. But you, the, and the gearbox is obviously much better than F12. But you drive it like a vintage car. You don't pretend it's new. You pretend that it's an XJS, XJ12 coupe. Basically. Yeah, okay, I get that. And the yeah. other thing is that there's this mythical 10, there were 10 599 GTBs sold as factory manuals. Yeah. And um, and I remember speaking to one of the engineers at the factory saying that they were the most expensive cars Ferrari ever sold at cost to Ferrari because they had to go to ZF, whatever it was, did the gearbox and pay for the homologation and development of a gearbox that they thought they were going to sell 150 cars and they ended up selling 10. So at unit cost, each car cost Ferrari about 400 grand to make. But they, I remember him, this particular character, his name I won't mention, he said it's one of the worst Ferraris he's ever driven. And even though these are unicorns, these manual cars, and I love the idea of a manual 599, everyone I know that's driven one says they're crap. Yeah. It's worse. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think for 80 grand, that is a, is a magical car, really. You just drive it like it's a Bristol 411 or yeah. an XJ12 coupe, pretend you're steed. And it's fine. And, I, and actually, it's also, it's a beautiful Ferrari. It's got handsome. real presence. Super okay. handsome. Yeah. Yeah. Manish, come on, tell me, what would you, so you're coming at this from a slightly different perspective. What would you be buying this year? Um, <clears throat> well, I know what my wife suggested I buy, <laughs> and, uh, which was hybrid BMW 7 Series, so we can get the dog in the back. But I, um, not wanting to preempt where this show is going, didn't fancy 60 kilo battery that never gets charged. So um, that sits in the bin. I'll tell you what I'm a little bit in love with, and I am definitely considering for the year, is um, a Ferrari 308 GT4, the Bertone oh, baby. Oh, very good. Cool. just very think cool. that is a, that I fell in love with it anyway, when I first saw it as a child. It features in the Sasha Distel Mandate commercial in white. And you've got to watch that commercial. That on YouTube, it's the finest commercial on YouTube. And it's great because he kisses this woman at the end and he turns around and says, it's all right, she's my wife. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody Wonderful. who wants a car, and it's, it's just what it is. It, it's, the, uh, it's the kind of Italian version of the Lotus Esprit S1 yeah. that just is, is more beautiful in every single little box. And, and those bucket and seats you, in the back. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You can see, the dog can sit in the back. That's the point. And the the thing, it's so pretty when you see it in real life. And I always fell in love with these wedges. I was in love with a wedge when I was eight, mm. and I'm still in love with the wedges now. So this this would just be my. It would be that first step to the LP400 of my dreams. That that's it. So but tangent. I, so a quick tangent there, because you've mentioned something very that is a is a much bigger, more important subject. Best looking bucket rear seat in a car. For me, it's a choice between Porsche 928 and 635 CSI. 635, I think. Yeah. Come on, that seat is... 928. Totally agree, totally agree. 928. Okay, Uh, Mr. Cooper, for you, you, you've got to go and buy a toy for the year. And it can can either be expensive or not expensive. A toy? Yeah. Um, You know me, I really like wagons. Yeah. I really like wagons, and they're just disappearing from our world. Mm. Um, and, you know, and you and I share this passion. We love Alpinas. Um, and mm. I keep seeing a green Alpina 3 Series and a 5 up at Vista Heritage where I spend a bit of time with my Motorsport UK hat on. And there's a couple in there. I just love them. They just mm. look yeah. so nice. Um, and Alpina's going, as we know. They've been bought effectively back in, and... Um, the family decided they can't carry on. They got two years to go. I think yeah. three years to go. Well, uh, under Bovenstein own- ownership. Under Bovenstein. Yeah, basically they got they got a. You know, what do they go? Oh, well, we may come on to the whole EV question, but you know, they've recognised reasonably so that they can't carry on. So yeah. So the answer to the question is, An Alpine. it does everything. That Alpina three series. It's smaller. I was going to say. I mean, I've got. A Panamera wagon, which I love because it's not an S, it's not a big SUV. It's better in every way than an SUV. But for a toy this year in slightly tougher times, perhaps, Alpina three series wagon, petrol. Yeah, lovely. Everything. 
really, really. Ingrained. But I've got a quirky one. I um I recently did a film for a television show I work on with with some sort of 20, 30 grand convertibles. I won't give away exactly um, which cars we use. But one of the cars that came up in research was a vehicle that I owned in 09, which is an, an R230 um, SL63, oh, which is the facelift yeah. car. Yeah. Now, this, this is one of the most surprising cars I ever owned because the SL55, which was the pre-facelift car, was shite, really. It was a big GT car, had a lot of power, had a big supercharged V8. But they, they out of nowhere came this sportier version with a diff with a 6.2 litre normal aspirated engine you can pick these things up for about thirty thousand pounds yeah you can. and they really are the ultimate all-weather sports car and when you look at the spec of the car and what you get and the way it drives pretty much identical mechanically car a, a c6 clk 63 black series 130 grand this thing is 30 grand yeah. and the roof comes off it okay it hasn't quite got the wide arches or the motorsport association but i think that's the best value sports car on it's sale I, a lovely honestly car. they drive better than the bloody latest ones it's a lot i borrowed one from somebody once i can't remember who it was and i drove it to belgium to a race meeting and it was faster than an slr down you know that sort of dip in the motorway when you go on yeah. south towards it was as fast as this must have been 2009 that car i've You're just got good. a friend that's bought one a blue navy blue one and it's fabulous little thing yeah. I think uh, I, I, I one of the things I that comes from existed, I, they, and it's got this MCT gearbox. It blips yep. on downshifts. I think one of the what, what I suppose to summarise that little chat. What, one of the great upsides to a bit of financial turmoil is I think a lot of people start suddenly think to themselves, "I've been a bit profligate for the last couple of years. I would take a deposit amount of money, put it down. I'd be happy paying drip against this. So I'd, I'd take my twenty-five grand." Yeah. And I'd put it against this, and I'll say to myself, I'll have six months of fun in that, and then I'll get away with it at the end of it. Now I just think I'd rather just own something outright with that 25 grand. Yeah. And when I start looking around, I'm suddenly seeing stuff I really want to buy, whether it's a slightly leggy, um, you know, M140i, whatever it might be. I just, I, I'm, I'm personally now unwilling to take on any more finance deals. I don't want any more in my life. I just don't want them. You love it. Always ruin. You love it. Exactly. I've got, Bernie, I got so Bernie, much. Bernie Eccleston always says, don't borrow money to buy things. Yeah, but it's all right for burning, isn't it? Some of us have got to borrow money because we've got enough of it. <laughs> he got I've other got people a, to borrow it. Yeah. I've got, okay. a tiny little, I've got a tiny little story on that, if you don't mind. Give me a minute. Go I, on. I, I, so I had... Uh, a big mortgage on a house in Muswell Hill. I had two young kids. I was desperate for a Porsche. I'd never owned one since 2000, 2002. And you remember, you used to, before the internet or Top Mark, I suppose, was the thing that you had in the bog. Top oh, Mark! Top Mark, which, you know, that's a whole episode. Oh, in I missed that. But you would look in the Sunday Times, right, and yeah. see, you know, Sunday Times. And there was Porsche Brighton, Riverdale, or whatever it was yeah, called. Riverdale. Yeah. Riverdale. Riverdale. And a 993 Turbo X50, 2,000 miles, silver with grey, one owner for 62 grand. And I thought, fuck it. I'm going to, I'm going to, honestly, I'm going to get that. Last of the air cooled. Um, so I went and bought it. You know, the old Porsche finance bubble. I think I had like five grand deposit. It was a grand a month. And I had this parked on the street. Brand new, pretty much, 993 Turbo X50. I then went for a meeting in a large department store in London where I do some business, and I had a meeting with the owner. And the owner is a, was a female, basically is a billionaire. And we walked out to the car park, and she said, oh, what floor are you on? And I'm thinking, oh, fucking hell, this is a bit embarrassing now. I'm going to look a bit flash. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm on level three. Oh, I'm on level three. So we walk on to level three. She walks over to a Mark II 16-valve Golf, which, you know, even at the time was only worth 10 grand or something. And I'm like, oh, my God. I click my remote control and the indicators flash. <laughs> this port. And I'm like, you idiot. You've got a big mortgage. You've got two young well. kids. I rang Riverdale. It's true. Rang them and said, take it back. I lost three grand, obviously. They did me up <laughs> for like three or four grand in three months. And I promised myself I would never do car finance from that moment on. And I haven't. Who would ask for you for doing that? I would have told her I was on level two. I got I made, yeah. I made a mistake. No, no, I felt such a tit when I was driving home thinking, you need to dump this, mate. Buy a car when you can afford it. I'd have seen yeah, it I, I, my problem is I never would have bought a car. And I think if... <laughs> 
Because <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't have been able to afford it. And because I'm an idiot, and, and Chris will know that, and I, Edward as well. Uh, yeah, so, that's so true. but I, I think okay, if you are, if, if finance is your only option, as long as you play the game with a modicum of respect to the rest of your life, i.e., that it can't, you know, the, your children yeah. and, and where you live are more important, I think it can be okay. And also, that yeah. you do get nice yeah, surprises get sometimes where you, where you play the game okay. I suppose the adjunct to that is I, I find it a bit icky when the sort of modern influencer environment just puts out this I've, today I've bought a, another six figure car but and, and I no one really knows how they buy them and I, I think that there is a danger that it sort of pushes this idea that frankly you can finance anything and it's always going to be okay but surely one of the things that will happen in 2023 is that a, a subprime will emerge where people think that the balloon you know, they think their car the balloon is 70 grand and the market views it as being worth 50,000 and before you know it, everyone's the wrong way around. That's yeah. when I totally agree with Neil that it's 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 dangerous. I think well, my, we're, my, my, we're anxiety, there. my anxiety Sorry? is always someone's gonna tap me on the shoulder and say, mate, you got one O level in art. You know, I don't know what you're doing in that desk. Get home, sort of thing. So I've I've never I never have a sense of security about any of my jobs ever. So I'm always sort of yeah, I struggle with contentment, and I always think I'm going to get the fi- get fired, basically. So I'm I'm always worried about taking on finance. You've come to the right place, Nick. We, we can do counselling here. Tell us more about your child. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no, very I'm impressed. Exactly. None of you uh, mentioned a BMW XM or Ferrari Pura Sangue. I, I would I would want to you know throw things at them, throw throw nuts and bolts at them because I really don't like them. But the XM makes total sense in an electric car strategy. They'll sell loads of them in the Middle East, sell loads of them in America, get the, get the coffers full of money, and then you can release your electric sports cars afterwards. And the purest sound, whatever you say about it, they've, I've heard they've sold the entire production run must already. Done. Yeah. Yeah. They must have done. Yeah. I mean, I, just I, don't imagine- find, I don't find it that offensive, the purest sound way. I wouldn't have one. Um, but the XM and all of that stuff, we were, we were at the um, below zero, the ice driving with the Touch Hill crowd in February and BMW were proving some of them. It just looked awful. But then BMWs looked awful for ages. Pure Sangue, I, I doesn't offend me. I wouldn't have one. I can see why people buy them. And if it means they can afford to do more of the fun stuff, it's the same as the Cayenne. Or like okay, that. here's a question for you on BMW. When the new sharp-nosed, bottom-faced M3 came out, I was one of the loudest detractors. I was yeah. pretty rude to the point where BMW got to be upset with me. I don't think they look as bad now. I, if I see one in the right colour, whereas I used to go, Wah! now I go, no. oh, it doesn't look too bad, that. What do I you reckon? they look good. I think they look good. No, they look bad. <laughs> and what about, the, what about the estate? The wagon's nice. It just seems yeah. to take Oh, nice. I think from the back, it's the lovely. Nice. Yeah. I don't like them. You can't like that nose. This, this, this is a definite... This is a definite is Angelica Houston a sex symbol conversation, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, you know, you're right. First movie, she's in The Witches. Now you're saying, oh, from behind and lit. And sort of, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Ugly. I, I'm ugly. never going to talk about it no, again. It's, yeah. it's unacceptable, that nose. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Talking about cars, people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. But let's have a little look here. I, I want to move on to the to the next of our of our little list of topics. Um, okay, Porsche. I think all of us here have uh, an aberration affinity with Porsche, and and I think if if uh, Neil and I and I think Chris uh, as well will agree, we view ourselves as car addicts. Um, then maybe at the heart of my addiction is Porsche. So I'm gonna, I'm going to I want to ask a really uh, tangential question, which is I've got a bit of a problem about the 911 Targa. I, that's a car I should hate, but I keep looking at 991 and 992 Targas and thinking they look fantastic. But do I need to go and have a chat with someone? Yeah. Am I becoming too old? What's going on? It's worse than that. I don't know what it is, Chris. I'm seriously worried for you. I don't... Do not get it? I, I sort of... I can understand. I occasionally see one in the car park and I'm thinking, hmm... And then, I, and then I wake up and thinking, you must be joking. It's just wrong. I think if really, you look... Manage, at the, manage, what's, the, manage, what's wrong with the Targa? Come on. I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a real man. I don't mind about that. Yeah, so I I do think it's trying a little bit too hard to be yeah. Steve Queen. I really do. And yeah. the thing is, you know, there was a moment for that. The, the, where, where, where I don't completely agree, Chris, is 
if you see the targa part of it, if we call that roll bar, if you see it in black, it's maybe mm. not quite so ugly. But mm. I just see that silver thing. It just reminds me of these bugaboo prams. You know, it's got it just, that's what it, I just want to put my hands behind it, put my <laughs> three year old child in the front, wheel him up to Hampstead and buy myself a very expensive coffee. That is <laughs> How many 911 convertibles has Chris Cooper had? He's had several. Um, three or four, although when we were talking before this and uh, I said, I'm too embarrassed to say what I've had three of, it wasn't the 911 convertible, it's worse. The six series <laughs> convertible. It's, it's six series convertible. Oh, I really I've, love I've been looking at those Alpina ones on, really, on auto oh, that's too much. No, that's too much. No, it's sort of the Bogo. It was a really lovely car. It just felt like a gentleman's conveyance. It was. It yeah, was I have to say, I watched you drive one to Germany once, Chris, and you looked like, and I use the word carefully, you looked like a predator. <laughs> you did say that. You did say that. It's the you, only we were car... driving through Belgium, and it looked like you were in a stop of an underground dungeon. It wasn't good. It did. It I... did look a bit. It did look a bit like that. It's the only car I've ever properly aquaplaned on the highway. On it was going to one of our. It must have been a VLN race. Oh yeah. eight or nine. Yeah. Properly one of those Belgian downpours, badly drained Belgian motorway, and the thing just lifted up, and I've. It's the only. God, that was scary. But lovely car. Yeah. So the Targa. I. Okay, well, obviously, I, I was looking for a bit of solidarity here. My yeah, fellow, you know, here you've been I, saved I've been, I've been a outed. Month, yeah. I've been outed to help. try and drive. But I'm changing it up here. So the electric revolution is, is all over the newspapers today because a broadsheet last week published a story, which I think was, was factual, saying that the car industry has finally decided that it's, it's no longer going to invest and waste billions in the electric revolution because the, the sales numbers aren't there and the infrastructure isn't there at all. So I, th I think also we can see from sales figures and from the fact that uh, uh, the particularly in the UK there's, there are there are no more grants available really to buy the car. It's not as tax efficient as it once was. So what do we think the electric revolution is slowing down? Do we think it's just taking a pause? Do we think it's a problem with the hardware or the infrastructure? It's a big old subject. This we'll cover a bit of it. And I suspect this, this will come up every other week this so is exactly this, this is a this is a big big episode i i wrote a few notes down here you know infrastructure is a massive problem yeah. for people that have allowed themselves to be adopted I, I don't know if they were adopted because they believe the infrastructure or they were adopting it because of the financial benefits of doing it and, and i think probably there's a bit of conflict in there yeah, we, we've got taxes coming towards us at the end of this year, which, you know, if we're the first country doing it, it there'll be many following. And, and then a, a lot of the competitors in these spaces are, are, are not just in the automotive media, they're in the financial media. And, and you know, Tesla who have been instrumental in in allowing the, the, the electric car revolution to almost exist. And now at the front page of the the, the business media over <laughs> over its decline in value, which will be having a it will be determining why people are wanting to get involved in this because if there's no future and we're you know we're seeing the plummeting used car prices at the moment it's it's mind blowing I think yeah. the BMW One X in December declined thirty seven percent in value, um, it, it, it's it's staggering. There was almost a kind of conning conspiracy behind a lot of this the the point is that we all want to do what's right i'm a father and i think you know we look at the the state of the world and i think none of us is particularly proud of emissions every time there's a new cop we sit down and pull our hairs out and go oh my gosh you know what are we leaving our kids and i think some very very clever people came up with a very clever conjuring trick and it especially bit urbanites like me you know, North London, classic, you know, you know, you want to do something good. There are children mm. dying of asthma in London, you know, get rid of your diesel, get rid of your petrol car. But I think this is the whole point. You know, I'm not sure that I want to reduce the emissions in central London at the cost of some child digging cobalt with their bare hands in the Congo. And I think the more you get into this, the more you realize that I th the, the aims and the ambitions, I think, are entirely noble. I just think sometimes when you do things far too quickly, um, some people do very, very well out of this stuff. You know, the really clever guys like Musk. I mean, yeah, my, my understanding is a large part of their early profits were carbon credits anyway. 
There's nothing about that weird car that comes out of Woody Allen's sleeper that attracts me at all. You know, and that's what it looks like. It looks like a car that was designed in 1973, driven by an iPad with four GoPros. I mean, yeah. I, I literally don't understand it, but it became a religion. It did. And that's what you all know. It's when cultish, something yeah. becomes a religion, you yeah, become a devil worshipper if you say anything <clears throat> against it. And I think maybe, you know, there's a brilliant place for these things in central London where you can charge it. I read that Giles Corrin piece. I don't particularly like his column, but talk about absolutely yeah. spot on at every yeah, single level. So who of us has tried running an electric car? I have one in central London, but obviously I don't have the range problems. I have a BMW i3, yeah. but I, to be honest with you, I'd have a BMW i3 even if it had a combustion engine in it because the, the so way the car, car is works for me. Yeah, I had an i3 quite a few years ago, six, five, six years ago. And I think now it would be, if they introduced it now, it would be a really cool car. It's quite light, yeah. decent enough range. It's I a agree. different kind of thing. It's one of the coolest still, I think. It is still one of the coolest. If you put aside, and, and manage, you're right, if you look at the pure, the total life cycle costs, uh, you know, there is, uh, is it sustainable? And that's why, you've personally, think, I've got... A, you've got to do 80,000 miles before yeah, it. which better. is why putting EVs in classic cars is the maddest idea I've ever heard. Yeah, I'm totally against it. I think, uh, I think but it's interesting the, um... hearing you guys talk about this, because uh, the, the way I've always viewed the electric vehicle is it, unless it can do what I view a motor car should do, it becomes a folly or it becomes a PR exercise. It becomes a way of you projecting your personality. And for me, the motor car is the is the one thing in my life that is, in, is entirely flexible at my behest. My motor car does exactly what I want it to do. It changes my life. I don't have to think about it at all. I, 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 don't have, I have to think about the rest of my life. I have to worry about what people think. I have to worry about what people are doing. But my car is there and at, at my control. And I found that an EV wasn't because i was having mm. to pre-plan i was having to be organized to be an adult and i couldn't do it i don't want to plan my journey i don't want to plan waypoints the moment a vehicle isn't infinitely flexible it's no longer a motor car it's either a train or it's an uber or it's a taxi i might as well have one of the others it just it's not at my control and i and at the moment it just doesn't work there is no infrastructure and also if it does work for you you're you're in such a narrow vertical it's almost it's almost certain, I hate, sorry, I shouldn't qualify the word certain, but you're probably well-resourced. You're a rich person who has a driveway. You work close to where you live. But if you actually use a car to go to Liverpool and back, then it's pointless. I don't see the point. So, I, I think an interesting person to invite, sorry, Manish, you go first. Oh, no, just saying that Chris and I jumped into a taxi together a couple of months ago, and the driver recognised Chris, and he started talking about his mates who had bought EV central London black cabs. Yeah. And it was a pretty cold day when we were in the car. And he said that a lot of these guys, apart from having to charge their cars all the time, are having to put sticky tape over the heaters. Because if their clients turn the heaters on, they reduce their range by 15, 20 minutes. That's that man's yeah. livelihood. Yeah, so that's forget mad. about your notions of utility. The guy can't earn money if his punters... <laughs> oh. So was, uh, Scandinavia are the, the like the biggest adopters of electric cars. And I was in Stockholm the other day. It was minus 12 and I got into an Uber and the guy warned me on the way to the airport. He goes, I'm only just going to get there because these electric cars don't like the cold. But and also the, the crazy thing is the, the, the London the electric London cabs that, that run at this time of year, most of them run them on the range extender the whole time. So they basically yeah. run a petrol generator yeah. to keep them full yeah, of... I mean, it's, it's, the irony is it, just it's just pathetic. But, just, you know... Just, you, you said about to people being well-resourced, and I just put two other points here. You, you made a comment to me a few months ago, which I found really interesting, which comes back to electric cars, is Rolls-Royce has spent 100 years trying to perfect the motor car and... and be able to put a pound coin on the engine and rev it. So, uh, you know, the electric uh, future actually is perfect for something like a Rolls Royce where it is. weight doesn't matter. And then the other comment I just put here was the hypercar. Now, we've all seen the incredible performance that an electric car has. Now, if we went away from electric, actually hypercars or you know they're not going to get any better anymore they might get louder and cooler but you know they're not going to actually move the game on and it will probably well it is coming to formula one as well i guess to, to a certain degree i'll quickly oh, answer just, I'll, quickly, I'll quickly answer some of that but but the the i think first of all the the, the electric hypercar 
has just confirmed how little of a shit most of us give about going really, really, really fast on the road. It's just, yeah. it's, it's meaningless. And actually, we're just getting to the point where it's going to be dangerous. That Rimac thing I drove a while ago was so goddamn fast that I, if, the idea of handing that performance to a normal adult that's, that thinks a, a, a 997 GTS is fast is the same as handing a nine-year-old a handgun. It, yeah. it is absolutely irresponsible. It's so fast, it'll do... Uh, on the open road in this country, you can accelerate or keep your foot flat for under two seconds at any one time before you're breaking the law. That's how bad it is. So maybe it just hastens us realising that, that the ultimate straight line performance is a folly that none of us really need. And also, it's a very limited trick. Once you've done it a couple of times, you're like, well, there you go. It's, it's you know, it's pretty average. But I do but, believe... But, but Chris, just one thing that you did, you tested the 296 um, on Top Gear. And uh, I've got to say, it's the first time I've fallen in love with a modern Ferrari since yeah. the, the 355. It just does it for me. I've actually seen it around. But does that car need 800 horsepower? Isn't it better just to stick those two batteries in a dustbin somewhere? Well, I'll tell you what, man. You've, 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 asked, you've, asked you've asked the question which should be applied to all hybrid supercars, which is, would this car be better if it weighed a third less exactly. and it had a third exactly. less power? And, and the answer is always, always, yes. it yes. would be better. Yeah. But sadly, legislation means that unless their twenty-two percent of their emissions are whatever, and you know, it's it's all now on a spreadsheet, they have to be made that way. But you speak to the poor engineers that have to make this stuff. I mean, honestly, you, you know, I'm not going to mention any names again, but particularly Ferrari, man that signs those off, he, he's almost in tears when he when he thinks about what he could do if he didn't have to have electricity in the vehicle. Yeah. So and that, and that hybrid bit when you look at F1. It was interesting when Sebastian bought Nigel's FW14 and ran it round Silverstone last Grand Prix with a sustainable fuel. It did, and I met a number of, it was British Grand Prix, because I met a number of the, the engineering and the engine and drivetrain technical heads. And I said, just between us, honestly, if we could prove the point about sustainable fuel and you could find an interest in the manufacturers, why wouldn't you just go back to a V10 or V12? And they all said, yes, they'd love to, yes. because yeah. environmentally it makes sense. And of course. Yeah, it's just, and we'd all, and we'd all love it. Well, I, I mean, the problem is then we're going to get into a debate about whether we should be using landmass to grow products that then that we can turn to fuel when it should be making food for people that can't eat. I mean, the, the, the moral arguments that spring out of this are so complicated that I suppose I have that moment where I want to get involved in the arguments. Then I take a step back and go, I just want to go. I want to put some fuel in my two CV and go for a drive. How fucking difficult can it be? I yeah. just it kills me. I, but, I but, think it's a comp know. It's one for another time for us. But if you look at um, what's going on in Chile, the Porsche thing, and the reason why it's there is because of sustainable power and so forth. Mm. Um, it will be expensive. There won't be much of it, but it will exist, and yeah. that's that's our hope. This is the synthetic fuel. We will yeah. um, with yeah. these um, with these podcasts, sofa chats, etc. We will put links to, uh, below in any of the interesting comments, so you guys can go and uh, the audience can go and uh, uh, brief themselves on some of the for three of us. Actually, yeah. just one point here for, for three of us. Why can't Porsche do synthetic hair? Because I'm looking at the screen here and thinking that we might benefit from that. I quite fancy having a bit of a rug again. I'm fine. Chris. Nice. How are you? Uh, not about thinning. thinning. Nothing. No, you're fine. You're fine from. Uh, well, there you go. Laugh at what we can. Okay, so uh, Korea, uh, often uh, lambasted for the work for certain uh, animals they eat, but <laughs> right, right now, right now, I cannot believe the success they're having. Uh, certainly in the UK, w with their, their two big brands here, Korea and Hyundai, Korea and Hyundai, are just doing so well. And I like the way the cars look. How is it? that they have managed to undo a sort of brand hierarchy that's been established with the Germans being at the top in a matter of years. Discuss, because I think they have. I think people now yeah. who would automatically aspire to have a Mercedes-Benz, a BMW and Audi, are now quite happily buying a Hyundai, which used to be, even 10 years ago, a mini cab that you laughed at. How has that happened? I don't think, it's, I don't think that brand reorganisation has happened so quickly ever in the motor car industry. So I was discussing with somebody yesterday uh, thinking about our conversation today, and somebody used a really great expression. They said that HMG, Hyundai, Motor Group have read the room well. And I think what they meant by that was 
they've worked out that if a car is attractive, looks okay, and is fun, it's nice to drive, suddenly, and it's attractively priced and sense we put together, and the service is there, and the dealers are enthusiastic, you know, each of these, it's the incremental gains of all the things, suddenly produces a proposition that's really hard to unpick when you're a legacy manufacturer and there's trouble with your dealer networks or the VW group, which is, you know, that's the conversation we're going to have to have sometime, you know, question, the world's most difficult to manage organisation, it must be Volkswagen Group. What a nightmare that must be. So I think it's just very, very thoughtful. They've hired very, very smart people from the best of breed from elsewhere. You know, it's, if you talk to Toto about what he thinks he's done at Mercedes, and you hear very, very similar language in terms of the structures, the people, the ambition, the shared goals, that they all think they're there for the same thing. And then you read, there was an interesting article on uh, on the intercooler about some of the whys and wherefores of the British motor and you think it's a million miles away in terms of why they're all there for the same reason. So yeah, I think it's it's a fantastic story. I think the great cars, we have some in the business. Yeah. You know it's not going to break. You buy a bloody McLaren, it breaks. You buy a Land Rover, it bloody breaks. Yeah, it's as simple as that. Yeah. One, mean, of the other, one, of, one of the other lovely side effects uh, or sort of um, associated stories from this is that I do love in the UK driving past a provincial high end dealership, someone that was, you know, a family that was loyal to the brand that was selling, they were having to push shite 20 years ago. And they were, yeah. and every other dealership was laughing at them. You know, all the VW big bollocks would have been laughing at them, flying over in their helicopters to go to the British Grand Prix, BRDC members. And those families who stuck with it are now laughing. Dreaming. They're flogging so much metal. And yeah. the Ford dealership around the corner is struggling. I think I, there's a lovely sharp pointer about that. So to manage quickly, I want to ask Manish one thing. So, what what do you think? It's a it's a part of their success plan that none of these Koreans seems to be that worried about going into the top form of motorsport. Everyone else is scrambling. We've got Cadillac lurking around the corner. <laughs> VW Group are in there with Audi. Porsche are desperate to get in there, but seem to have made a bit of a horlicks of their discussion with Red Bull. But the Koreans couldn't give a monkey's. They spend a bit of money going rallying. That's their lot. Well, I think you know Formula One is. PR for a lot of undifferentiated cars. And it's, it, it, it's funny you say that. I mean, you know, I remember hating with a passion the Ford Sierra when it came out. It was probably the only precocious car thought I ever had because I looked at it and I thought, oh my God, I think that, that is what all cars are going to look like. And I don't think I was incredibly wrong. And I think that maybe for, for, for the um, South Koreans, they're not sitting there going, that's such a terrible... That is such a terrible thing. And as Chris said, you know, beauty is very much in the eye of the beholder and they've got enough empathy to understand their beholders. And I, my analogy would be something like British Airways is dominating the market um, in all classes to New York and Los Angeles. And this upstart Richard Branson turns up and he just does it in a very slightly more, yeah. you know, he knows exactly what he's going for. He's not going to get all the business passengers, but he's going to get the young, funky guys, you know, the creator. Yeah kind of industry. Yeah. So he puts a little bar in and he's got them. And BA are suddenly trying to nick those passengers back off, but it's too late. Yeah. But it's too it's late. Gone. It does, but it does feel like they, they've done a job in a way and at a price level that I didn't think was possible. I, I'll give you an So my analogy would be families that would only have wanted to buy Mercedes Benz or you know one of those big German brands will happily buy a Kia or Hyundai now, which which is I think strange. Whereas if you went into a hi-fi or an electronics superstore and there was a new tv next to the sony which was called a matsui or whatever we used to laugh at that dixon's was trying to flog their own brand stuff in the 80s you didn't buy it even if someone told you it was brilliant you wouldn't buy it because you wouldn't want your mates to go he's only gone and got the shot because yeah. th there's a brand snobbery there that you course, that you wouldn't want you would be able to get over isn't there a tiny bit of analogy with what they call you know kind of classic public school fees inflation the whole point is that there are certain hyper brands or certain brands that are suddenly being priced out of whatever you would describe the middle class market is. And I think any smarty pants just realizes, hold on, you know, maybe these guys, given the way that the 21st century is configured, can't afford that entry level Mercedes. Afford them. You, know what? They you know what? That's a really good point, man. It's a really, yeah. really good point. Because I, only the other day I was looking at a Honda Civic Type R. I've just driven one. For the telly show it's a i love hot hatches it's a blindingly good car and i think it looks it doesn't look like it was styled like a five-year-old like the previous one you could actually own one and not be embarrassed 
and in white with the red leather front, sorry, the red Alcantara front seat. It just, it just jangles all of my sort of Integra memories from the 90s. And I thought, I'll buy one of these and it'd be great to run it for a year. It's high £50,000 it, uh, for a hot hatch. Yeah. So you're right. These cars are being priced out of, out of the normal mm. middle class market, aren't they? What, what's, what's a base... McCann Turbo now. I mean, it's, it's incredible amounts of money, isn't it? Or, or a, yeah. a, a yeah, Defender. How much money can you drop on a Defender? While it's still there, yeah. It's interesting. The most thought question with the Koreans is quite interesting because how many people know that last year's British touring car champion drove a Hyundai? Uh, <laughs> Not me. I actually, I, actually go- I actually Googled it yesterday to check. And you can see Bristol Street Motors and Accelerate Motorsport. But in none of the stuff on beat on Alan Gow's own website, BTCC, does it say it's a Hyundai? And it clearly they have been involved. Um, it's a lovely, it's actually a nice looking thing. So you're right. I think they haven't, they've got involved. I think the WRC is quite cool. I think that's done sort of something for them. Um, although it's still got very, very low visibility. But it's just a really strong product. It's a strong work. You know, Vauxhall has recovered. I think Vauxhall and whoever owns them today, um I looked at that as well and said we can't just keep flogging something called a viva or whatever it is and look at the numbers and how the corsa overtook the fiesta last year and i they clearly twigged that there are some basics if you get all of those basics right particularly with service then you go. i'm so i'm i'm really there's, there's a future for affordable motoring that's that's actually aspirational because it's fun and you enjoy driving it and you get out and I think, yeah, mm. I'm all for it. I think it's a brilliant story. Mm. Okay. I think we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna wrap that one up there. It's been uh yeah, really interesting. And I have to say for me, um everyone had their mot juice, but I'm gonna hand today's prize over to Manish, who describes Alonso as a grenade with the pin removed from it, which I think is something that I'll take from it. Yeah. Um so uh, we'll we'll do something uh, with this. We'll broadcast it. Any comments, please write them. Be kind, because these people here have given their time to do this, so don't be horrible. Um, try and pick up the pen if you do and write positive things. Thank you so much to Neil, Chris, Manish and Edward. Uh, and we'll be back. And I, before we leave, I'm going to say one thing I'm going to do with my car this week, because this morning I got up and it was frosty and it made me realise that the wiper blades on my Land Cruiser are inadequate. So I'm going to change the wiper blades on my car. I've got this funny thing that when you put new wiper blades on a car, it suddenly makes it feel like it's five years That's younger and yeah. that you love it. Each of you, tell me something you can do with your car this week. I'll put you on the spot. Cleaned it. Clean, Clean, cars, it. Are nicer. Clean cars are nicer to drive. It's just a fact. Bill? A flat battery. Any little wheel scuff that the wife has done this week. We should spend more time together, Neil. That's yeah. a whole podcast <laughs> in, its, in its own, I would think. Yeah. So there we go. That was our first sofa chat, or whatever we're going to call it. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it enjoyable. I certainly did. Tune in next time, uh, where we will carry on talking absolute nonsense about cars and most of